Amen. We're going to be preaching from Romans chapter 13 today. Romans 13 verses 11 through 14. Romans 13, 11 through 14. Yes. 13, 11 through 14. When you have it, say amen. Scripture reads as follows, and do this, knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep, for now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Therefore, let us cast off the works of darkness, and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly, as in the day, not in revelry and drunkenness, not in lewdness and lust, not in strife and envy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lust. The word of God for the people of God. Thank you. I'm going to share a brief word with you uh, this morning entitled, The Time is Now. The Time is Now. And I put an exclamation point time is now. There is an expression in the English language that says there's no time like the present. Have you heard the expression before? The idiom is used to convey the idea that the best time to do something is now rather than later. <clears throat> if, for example, someone approached me and asked, Reverend Wilson, is today a good day to accept Jesus as my Lord and Savior? I will respond, there's no time like the present. In the time of Christ, there was a temporal expression in common usage. The expression was, four months yet until harvest. Four months yet until harvest. In Israel, the end of the autumn months is actually when the harvest is over. It's four months until the harvest begins again in spring. Therefore, the expression, four months yet until harvest. Jesus referred to the expression in the fourth chapter of John, verse 35. He said there, don't you have a saying, it's still four months until harvest? I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields. They are already ready for the harvest. The saying, four months yet until harvest, seems to have been a sentiment of procrastination in Jesus' time. The thinking behind the expression was, the harvest isn't for another four months, so we don't have to worry about that right now. Are you with me? Jesus, however, pushed back against this cultural phrase, insisting that his kingdom wasn't someday far off, but present and available now. Accordingly, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 9, verses 37 and 38, the harvest truly is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. The urgency of the moment that Jesus taught concerning his kingdom was inescapable. The premise that Jesus stood on as it related to entry into the kingdom of God was that there's no time like the present, that the time is now. Human beings, we should know, perceive time differently. Time is more than the movement of the second hand or the clock or the sifting sands in an hourglass. In terms of human perception, the experience of time that is, what occurs during the passage of time influences our perception of time. There was an article released by NPR that explained how the pandemic has warped our sense of time. A woman from Manchester, England, who was interviewed for the article said that during the pandemic, it was as if time stood still. It was like climbing a mountain that never ended. She further noted, I could not believe there were 24 hours in the day, 
It dragged like a massive concrete block behind me. And yet others reported that time seemed to move faster during the same period. In spite of these varying perceptions of time, the fact is our time here on earth is limited. Our time here on earth is limited. The 14th chapter of the book of Job begins with these words. Man who is born of a woman is few of days and full of trouble. He comes forth like a flower and fades away. He flees like a shadow and does not continue. In James chapter 4 verse 14, the apostle asks, what is your life? Then he answers the question saying, for you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. Ecclesiastes chapter 3 begins with these words, to everything there is a season, a time for every purpose under heaven, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to pluck up what is planted. My point in highlighting these passages is simply to make the point that although we may perceive time differently, our time down here is limited. Indeed, our days are numbered. Now, I got this revelation about three weeks ago on the Sunday that a former classmate and teammate of mine, Brother Terrence Clark, came into this very room for a surprise visit. Do you remember the day? We had not seen each other for 33 years. When I was catching up with Terrence after the church service, he said to me, you know, Sean, we have more days behind us than we do ahead of us. When he said those words, I was rattled to my core, but I tried not to show it. I had told my wife, Vanessa, that Terrence's visit did not feel like a regular visit. It felt more like a prophetic encounter. In retrospect, I understand that Terrence came here, my classmate since the third grade, my high school wrestling, football, and cross country teammate, whom I had not seen in 33 years to reorient me in time. You see, I had kind of lost track of time. The pandemic has been so incredibly disorienting. But the Lord sent Brother Clark to tell me that the night is far spent and the day is at hand. Yes, God sent him to tell me that it's high time to awake out of sleep and be about my father's business. Why? Because the days are running short and the time is now. Now, I want you to think about this sermon. I'm almost done. But I want you to think about this in terms of not just salvation. Because a lot of us, we, we claim salvation. We know the Lord Jesus as our, as our personal Savior, as our Redeemer. We trust in God. We've been filled with the Holy Spirit. And so, so we, we, we got that peace. But, but the time is now for some other stuff too, yes? It's not, it's, if you're saved, that's great. But, but the time, there's, a, there's an urgency about what God has called us specifically to do in the, in the years that he's given us to do them, Yes? So we've got to, we've got to sort of get, get to the point where we were saying, okay, God, yes, I know that my time down here is limited. Time keeps on, what do they say? Time keeps on clicking. Is that what they say? Into the future. Is that what it says? And, that, and I really don't have forever down here. Yes. If we, if we, if we take the hour, we sleep about eight hours in a, a day out of 24, right? So let's do the math on that. We're, we're sleeping for about a third of our lifetime. We're sleeping. Are you, are you following me? So we've got, to, we've got to be expedient and urgent about what God is calling us to do in the time that he's giving us to do it. Yes? So the time really is now. I believe I, I preached already, but I, I do want to take a brief moment to consider the Apostle Paul's revelation about time in his letter to the Christians in Rome. When Paul wrote the book of Romans about A.D. 56, he had not yet been to Rome. But he had been preaching the gospel since his conversion in A.D. 35. So Romans is a mature statement of Paul's understanding of the gospel. In Romans chapter 13, verses 11 through 14, the apostle offers multiple revelations on time and our need for salvation. Or in Paul's language, 
putting on the Lord Jesus Christ. Hear again the words of the apostle in the message version. But make sure that you don't get so absorbed and exhausted in taking care of all your day-by-day -day obligations that you lose track of the time and doze off, oblivious to God. The night is about over. Dawn is about to break. Be up and awake to do what God is doing. God is putting the finishing touches on the salvation work he began when we first believe. We can't afford to waste a minute, must not squander these precious daylight hours in frivolity and indulgence, in sleeping around and dissipation, in bickering and grabbing everything in sight. Get out of bed and get dressed. Don't loiter and linger waiting until the very last minute. Dress yourselves in Christ and be up and about. The first lesson that Paul teaches here is the value of knowing the time. And do this, he wrote, knowing the time that now it is high time to awake out of sleep, for now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. By the phrase, knowing the time, Paul is going well beyond what the position of the hour hand on a clock or the shadow cast on a sundial represents. Instead, Paul is teaching that we must be discerning of the moment and the season in which we're living, yes? What good is it to know the time on the clock, whether it's three in the morning or three in the afternoon, and we don't know what time it is? Are you with me? The reason that it's so important to be discerning of the times is because every season has a spirit. <laughs> if you don't believe me, read Ephesians chapter 2 when you have a chance. Every season, there's a, there's a spirit to every age and every season. The spirit of the age or the spirit of the times is the set of ideas, beliefs, and aims that, that is typical of a people in a particular period in history. In this age, it seems, so many are given to talking about manifestation. Have you heard this? It's, it's manifestation this and manifestation that. Listen to me very carefully. I'm not jumping on the manifestation train. Because there are all types of manifestations, yes? There are dark manifestations and demonic manifestations and evil manifestations. There are, in fact, manifestations that oppose the will of God, yes? Paul calls them in Philippians chapter 3, verse 18, enemies of the cross, yes? Listen, the only Asian that I'm interested in now is impartation. That is the impartation of the Holy Spirit, yes? For God says in Joel chapter 2, and it shall come to pass that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. And also on my men servants and on my maid servants, I will pour out my spirit on the, in those days. And I, I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. And it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Yes. God's word here brings us to the revelation of the specific times we're living in this very day. Now, I believe, and I, you, you don't have to take it from me. This is just me. I believe that we're living in the last days. Yes, we talked about, we talked about prayer for the economy, but, but scarcity on the earth is one of the signs of the time. And if we're not reading our Bibles, we really don't, we're not, we're not on to what's really happening. Yes, we just think Russia's, Russia's invading Ukraine. That's it. We just, oh, we're reading it in CNN, but we're really not on to what's really, really happening in the world. But we have to be discerning of the times in which we're living. Do you believe? Believe me? Amen. I believe these are the last days, the days that Paul described as perilous times in his letter to Timothy. 
Times in which people are lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power. I believe that these are the days in which we're living. Now, if that's not a description of the days in which we're living, I don't know what is. And in such a time as this, the disciples of Jesus cannot afford to be asleep. At the decisive hour in the Garden of Gethsemane, the disciples of Jesus, I remind you, were found sleeping when they should have been praying with Jesus. Do you remember the passage? And three times, Jesus told them to wake up. I believe God is saying it to me right now in my spirit. Sean, it's time to wake up. <laughs> it's time, it's really, really, it's high time to wake up, yes? And whether we, whether we own it or not, we're a lot like the disciples in the garden, yes? We're on Facebook when we should be in the good book, yes? We're on TikTok and Instagram and Netflix and this app and that app. And before you know it, we're completely hypnotized by technology, by things that are fleeting when the scripture tells us to seek those things which are above where Christ is. Yes. In addition to knowing the time, the Apostle Paul admonishes us to put on the Lord Jesus Christ, to dress ourselves in Christ. Are you with me? Let me, before I go into this last point, I want to talk about, I want to talk about waking up. And I, I want to talk about, I, I want us to go back to the garden because Jesus is not telling the rank sinner to wake up. He's telling the people that have been ministering with him for three years. <laughs> He's talking to the people who performed miracles themselves, Yes. He's talking to the people that took the bread and from his hands and fed it to the 5,000. That's just men, but probably 15 or 20,000, including women and children. These are the ones that took the bread and fed it to them as they were seated in groups. Yes? These are the, one of these disciples, in fact, walked on the, on the Sea of Galilee. Are you with me? These are the disciples that, that, that prayed and that went out and, and witnessed in the power of the Holy Spirit as Christ had, had commissioned them. And these, these, are, these are this group. Are, are you telling, are you with me now? So he's, he's speaking to his own disciples. The people who, who when they were on the, on the sea uh, fishing, and he said, follow me, and I will make you fish for, for people. They dropped their nets, and they followed. They left everything, and they followed. These, this, these are these people here. And he said to them three times, wake up. He went back to pray. His he comes back to his disciples. His disciples are not praying. He said, he said the spirit is, is willing, he says. But the flesh is weak. Is weak. And he's speaking. The word to the disciples is a word to us. We're disciples. So this is not for somebody else. This is for us. And what he's saying to us, he said, you've got to wake up now. <laughs> this is for me today. You've got to wake up now and you've got to act like I'm, I'm coming tomorrow. You've got to act like I'm coming within hours. You've got to act like I'm on my way, that I'm on the clouds and I'm making my descent into the earth one more time. You've got to act like it's, I'm that close to you because the days are running. Wake up. Now, I don't know what wake up means to you. You have to kind of figure that out and pray and ask God and, and see God and, and, and pray for the anointing of the Holy Spirit to say, God, what, is, what, what parts of my life do I really need to wake up? Where, where am I sleeping and I need to be paying attention? Because listen to me very carefully. The, the devil is, is so crafty. <laughs> he has a way of pulling us in and we don't, we don't realize we're pulled in. And sometimes the danger of it is that we never realize we've been pulled in. Yes. Yeah. Now, I'm just, I'm just, just me. I'm just going to give you an example. I, you know, this is not a therapy session, but I will say that when we, when we started this, this ministry, you know, I was not a Facebooker. I didn't even have an account. I'm talking about for years. I recently got a Facebook account. I put my picture up on Facebook and Brian said, welcome, welcome. You did it, my brother. <laughs> I've been holding out for years. I've been holding out for years. 
But see, when we, when we start doing the church, you know, you kind of have to navigate social media. You can't. I can't pass out cards to people and say, I got to be, you, you, you understand, you, you've, got to, you've got to navigate the, the social media platforms in order to get the gospel out, in order to highlight what's, what's happening in your ministry. And what I found out is that, is that it, it, I started to get pulled in. And pulled in, when I say pulled in, I mean, I, I'm checking too much. You, you follow? I'm checking Facebook and I, I, I should be reading. I'm checking Facebook and I should be studying. I'm checking Facebook and I should be fasting. I'm checking Facebook and I should be praying. And I'm getting pulled in and what happens here, here's how we get pulled in. We don't even realize how, how much time we're on. You're gonna sleep for about eight. If you, you're gonna work for about eight. L listen to me. And, and, and when we add up all of the hours of the day, include, we, we, really, we really haven't given any time to God. Are, are you listening to me? We really haven't given any time to God. And what God is saying, what God is saying, sure, you, you've got to wake up now. You're a disciple. Yes, you've answered the call. Yes, you said, uh, I'll follow you. I'll follow you. Make me and I'll fish for people. You said yes to all of that, but you're sleeping. This is just me, but you're but you're, you're slumbering. You're, you're, you're sleeping and you, you, should be, you should be awake because the, the, the time is now. Yes. And what, what, I, what I'm feeling now, I don't know who this is for, but what I'm feeling now is that the urgency of the moment is not, is not just about making it to heaven. The urgency of the moment is not missing what God has for you this year. Amen. And if we're not urgent, listen to me, sometimes, sometimes we're not urgent and the opportunity just is gone. You, you know what I'm saying? The, the train left the station and we can't get there now. And, so, and we're not urgent. We're not urgent enough. And the train has left the station and we can, we can never get to the destination. It's too far away. And the amount of time that we have left, we cannot get to the destination. Are you following me? And so God is saying to somebody, he said, you've got to wake up so you don't miss the opportunity. Because the opportunity is not going to come this way again. Amen. It's not going to come this way again. So he said, wake up. Wake up. The time is now. In addition to knowing the time, the apostle admonishes us to put on the Lord Jesus Christ, to dress ourselves in Christ. Now, it may come as a surprise to you how often people have said to me over the years, Reverend Wilson, I'm going to come to church as soon as I get some new church clothes. I've heard this. I've heard this in Massachusetts. I've heard it in Pennsylvania. I've heard it in Maryland. I'm going to come to church as soon as I get some new clothes. And by new clothes, I understood them to mean church clothes as, as, as outfits which they thought were appropriate for worship. Are you with me? Amen. It was always difficult for me to hear this excuse for not coming to church because we all have to put on Christ irrespective of what we're wearing. Yes? If you have on the latest Armani or hand-me-down Oshkosh Bagash, the invitation is the same, to dress yourself in Christ, yes? Putting on Christ, we should know, is a two-part undertaking. Because Jesus is the light of the world. Because we cannot put on Christ and hold on to the darkness, yes? The Apostle Paul says that we must cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. In a time such as this, we need the armor of light to bear witness to the light of Christ in an ever-darkening world and as a shield from all that would harm us. Putting on the armor of light or putting on the Lord Jesus Christ is not an impossible feat. It is possible. In fact, God sent a living example to this earth in his only begotten son for us to emulate. And for those who would argue that the teachings of Jesus and the example that he has set for us to embody are too complicated. I would simply remind you that Jesus simplified it for us in Matthew 22, where he speaks of the greatest commandment in the law. And this is what he says. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Listen to me very carefully. If we can love God with all we have, 
And we can, and if we can love our neighbors as we, we love ourselves, we are effectively putting on Jesus Christ. Yes? Amen. Think about it. If, if, it's, if it's too complicated, just, just go back to this. Go back, go to Matthew 22 and say, God, say, God says, love, love God with everything you got. All your heart, all your mind, your soul, and your strength. And love your neighbor as you love yourself. It, the thing is, we, 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 kinda, we don't talk about the golden rule uh, very much anymore. But, but it says, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. It's very simple, yes? And, but if we, can, if we can follow this, that when we do this, we're actually putting on Christ. Now, I should, I should inform you that putting on Christ means living in the tension between the cross and the crown. Are you following me? I said it last week and I'll say it again. Being a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ is not an easy street experience. I'm, I'm saying that I'm saying that from a person who put on the Lord Jesus Christ, who committed to be a disciple of Jesus. It is not. Listen, if you're looking for easy street it's not in discipleship. It is not an easy street existence. Why? Because we cannot put on Christ without taking up a cross. There, there is a cross for us to bear when we say we want to be, we want to, and, and the time is now. Whoever, whoever this is for, the time is now that, that the challenge is to, to be like Christ. Yes? And to be like Christ, we, we've, got, we've, got to, we've got to put up, we've got to take on a cross. Yes? And this is, this is the hardest, this is the hardest part of discipleship. Is, is the cross. I, I love the glory. I mean, I love the glory in this walk with Christ. I mean, I, I can bask in God's glory every single day, 24 hours a day, if it was possible. I would just bask in the anointing and the holy presence of God every day, 24 hours a day. But, but in, in seasons of life, uh, there's glory, but, but there's also suffering. There's, all, there's seasons that, that we, we would rather soon forget, yes, there are experiences that we that we live through that we, we don't even want to really remember what we what we had to go through. But that is the life, that is the journey of a disciple of Jesus Christ. Yes. And I understand now why why that's the type of journey. Because if it was all glory, we wouldn't need Jesus Christ. If it, were, if it was all good days, we wouldn't need God. Yes. If it was all happy times, we wouldn't need the impartation of the Holy Ghost. But in order to get through this life, church, we need God now more than we ever needed him before. Now, this is the thing. He gives us, he gives us power to carry the cross. <laughs> the scripture says that, that he will not put more on us than we can bear. Is that, is that what the scripture says? He will, he, will, he will not tempt us beyond what we're able to bear. But with the temptation, he'll make a way of escape that we may be able to bear it. So God, God has already set us up for success. For those of us who, who don't like to talk a whole lot about the cross, know that God has already positioned you for success. Yes? You, you can do it. You can be a disciple of Jesus Christ. You can carry the cross. Yes? And you can wear the crown as well. Yes? So there are some crucified moments in life. We cannot, we cannot, we cannot escape, escape them. There are going to be some crucified moments in this life. Yes, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go back. I'm gonna go back, and then I'm, I'm finished right here. I, I've had to live through some very difficult experiences, and, and now, now, now that I'm coming out, I actually wonder how was I able to do it. You know how? Why, how, how was I able? Because you know, you know, when you're living under stress for long periods of time, you know, you can get sick. You can come down with it, fatal. Illnesses and ailments. I mean, this is, this is happens. It happens. And you know, why, well, why did you? What would have happened? What happened? You know, you just living under stress for so for so long. And I'm thinking, oh, how would I, how was I able to to navigate that for so long? How was I able to do it? And you know, you know, you know how I was able to do it. You know how I was able to do it. God gave me strength to do it. Amen. See, it's a setup for failure if God gives us a cross and there's no crown. It's a setup for failure if God puts his heavy cross on my shoulders to bear with people laughing at me, mocking me, whipping me, talking about me, lying on me. And that is my whole journey. But he gives, he gives us power in order to do it. And then, I, and then not, not just when our life is over. Listen to me. The crown is not just the crown of life in heaven. There are crowning moments right here. This is what I want you to hear. In this season of Lent, this is our theme. That there are crowning moments. 
moments in this life. Amen. And I'm not, I'm not waiting till I get to heaven in the by and by to experience the glory that God has for me in this earth. Listen to me. The incarnation, that is, that is the embodiment of God in the person of Jesus Christ on this earth was for the purpose of us experiencing the glory of God in this life. Amen. God sent glory to the earth to show us that glory is possible. Amen. <laughs> God, sent, God sent glory to this earth to show us that glory. Now, so if you want to talk about manifestation, talk about it in terms of the incarnation. The embodiment of God in this earth. And the reason that one of the reasons that Christ came is to show us that glory is possible. Yes. When Jesus was baptized in the Jordan River by John, he came out of the Jordan River. The, what is this? What does the scripture says? Behold, the, the spirit of God alighted upon him as a dove and a voice came from heaven saying, this is my beloved son in him. I am well pleased. Yes. Do, do you get it? Do you see the glory coming down from heaven? It wasn't a glory reserved in heaven. It was a glory that, that intercepted this realm. And what God is saying, yes, there's a cross for you, Sean, but there's some crowning moments. And what I want you to do, what I want you to do, I want you to get in touch with your crowning moments. Whenever, whenever, whenever you're depressed and whenever you're thinking about what happened and what they did and what they said, I want you to grab one of those crowning moments. Whenever you're thinking about, oh, if I could have this, if I could have did, if I could have did that, and you're living it, oh, woe is me. I want you to grab one of those crowning moments because I, I trust me, there's a crowning moment for every for every cross moment. There's a crowning moment. <laughs> Sometimes you gotta think about it. For every cross moment, there's a crowning moment, and you need to grab that crowning moment every now and again and say, say, God, you know that was a terrible thing to go through. It was horrible. It was a nightmare, but God. God, it was miserable. I almost lost my way. My feet almost slipped. But God, yes. God, God, I could have died. I could have had. I, I could have died. I could have been in a hospital. I could have had a stroke from from hypertension. But God, God, I could have lost everything. I could have lost my car. I could have lost the house. I could have lost my kids. I could have lost my wife. But God, there's a crowning moment for every cross. See, God, God is a genius. <laughs> so for those of you who are trying to decide, I like Christianity. It sounds good. It sounds like it's something that I could get into. But, but, but you know, it's too much. It's, it's, calling, it's calling too much for me. Listen to me. Life is too much. If you don't carry the cross, it's going to be a whole lot. If you don't take, take the cross, it's going to be. So you might as well take the cross because when we carry the cross, we live with a guarantee of a crown. So I want you to grab your crowning moment. I'm done. But I, I want you to think about your crowning moments in life. The way it happened in the Bible. This is, this is how they did it in the Old Testament. Think about crowning moment. Yes, the children of Israel had, had, had been traveling uh, uh, through, the, through the Sinai Peninsula for 40 years. It was a horrible experience. There were cross moments everywhere you turned. Everywhere you turned. It was, there, there was no water. There was no food. There were serpents biting people. Uh, there, was a, there was an insurrection in the desert. There was all kind of stuff. They didn't know where they were going. And, and at, at every juncture, God met his people's needs. Amen. When they didn't have water, God told Moses, strike the rock, and there's water. When they complained to Moses and said, there's nothing to eat, did he bring us out here? Uh, at least we had bread to eat in Egypt. Why did he bring us out here to die? And God sent bread from heaven. When they got tired of bread, God sent them quail. I read the story. When they, didn't, when they didn't know where to go, God sent them a pillar of fire by night. And they followed the pillar of fire. And in the day, they, they followed a pillar of cloud. At every cross moment, God provided for his people's needs. And then they got to the, to the, to the, to the precipice of the promised land after 40 years. Moses went to the top of Pishka and he looked over into the, he peered over to the land of promise. He had led God's people for 40 years and they're on the boundary of the promised land and they cannot get there. 
And God says, God says, listen, tell, have the priest take the Ark of the Covenant into the water. When their feet touch the water, the walls of the Jordan will wall up and Israel will walk across on, on, on dry ground because there's a crown for every, listen to me, for every time. Read your Bible. For every moment in life. And, and so when they got to the other side, this is, this is the crowning moment and I'm finished. God said, I want you to take, I want you to take 12 stones. <laughs> take 12 stones that are that are in the riverbed and, and take a one, one person from each tribe, from the tribe of Levi and Asher and Manasseh and Benjamin. I want you to take every, take a stone. And I want you to put it on the promised land side. So when your children come and ask about these stones, you can tell them that, that God wove up the waters of the Jordan River that we couldn't get through because the Jordan was overflowing its banks at the harvest time. We couldn't get through, and, and the priests walked into the water. You should have been there. I wish you could have been there. I wish you could have saw the priests walking into the water, bearing the Ark of the Covenant, and the waters walling up, and Israel walked across on dry. These stones are for a memorial. These are your crowning moments when, when you couldn't see your way out. <laughs> when the promised land was beyond your reach. You could see it, but you couldn't get to These are a memorial. You tell this to the next generation that, listen to me, we were, we were, we were carrying a cross, but God had a crown for us. So grab your crowning moment right now in Jesus' name. Let us pray. Grab your crowning moment right now. Just think of it. Grab one or two or three crowning moments. Whatever we're thinking, however we feel right now, just think about them. The meditate on the whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are of good report. If there be any praise, if there be any virtue, God says, think on these things. So God, we, we grab our crowning moments right now. And we rejoice, God, that we're here today. It didn't have to be this way. We, we could be dead, sleeping in our graves. But God, but God, you preserved us alive through pandemic. You're, you're preserving us through endemic, God. And we thank you right now for keeping us, for sustaining us. We thank you, God, for giving us a vision for life, God. And right now we grab our crowning moments. We got the cross. We're not letting that go, God. We, we've got that. But we're, we're thinking about our crowning moments and the ways in which you miraculously delivered us one time after the other. We thank you, God. You didn't have to do it, but you did. And for that, God, we give you praise, we give you honor, and we give you glory. God, and we thank you for this revelation about the urgency of this moment. That the time is now, that today is the day of salvation. And if there is someone who has not come to that realization that the time is now, we pray that they would put on the Lord Jesus Christ today and be guided by his teachings, saved by his grace, and redeemed by his blood. <clears throat> Romans 10 and 9 says that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. This is our confession today. This is our belief. Save us, we pray. <clears throat> 